many of the drugs that we administer to our patients either ionize or associate when they're injected or absorbed into the body. And that is determined by the local pH and the pKa of the drug. This tutorial is about a couple of different types of drugs that we give our patients that are weak bases. They are local anesthetics and opioids. And I find it really fascinating how the pH of the blood and the intracellular environment can affect how these drugs work. Ions and the pKa. This is a discussion about the impact of acid-base balance on the pharmacology of local anesthetics and opioids. Welcome back. Previously we discussed how ions carry electrical charge that is characterized by valency in milliequivalents per liter. Electrical neutrality must hold across all body systems and the degree of dissociation of all ions is determined by the pKa or the ion dissociation constant. Strong ions are fully dissociated and the difference in charge carried by strong cations and strong anions is the strong ion difference and it's always positive. The electrical balance is provided by weak acids, sometimes known as the A toad. Before I start this tutorial, I want to revisit pKa versus the degree of dissociation and association for acids and bases, as it seems to me that a lot of clinicians find this confusing and it's relatively easy. The pKa is the pH at which an acid or a base is 50% dissociated into its ionic components and 50% associated. In the case of an acid, that is an anion plus a hydrogen ion equivalent. What makes an acid an acid is that as the pH falls, the degree of association increases. As the pH rises, the degree of dissociation increases. We previously saw for lactate where the pKa is between 3.4 and 3.8, meaning that at physiological pH between 7 and 7.55, the acid is really completely dissociated. So there's no lactic acid at a pH of 7.4. If you go all the way down to a pH of 6, there'd be a little bit of lactic acid. Down to pH of 5, lots of lactic acid. pH of 1, tons of lactic acid. And that's the whole thing. The more acidic the environment, the more associated the acid is. The more alkaline the environment, the less associated the acid is. Now, in this particular picture, you'll see that the degree of association and dissociation is in a straight line. That's not how it really occurs. It's actually S-shaped. But in terms of trying to explain this and remember this, it's easier to present it in this way. When we look at alkali, we have the same picture. We have this pKa at a pH at which the alkali is 50% associated and 50% dissociated. But as the pH rises, the degree of association, for example, for sodium hydroxide, increases progressively. And as the pH falls, the environment becomes more acidic, the degree of dissociation increases. There is just, for example, sodium. Importantly, as we understand it, pH as a concept is man-made, it's entirely arbitrary. The pKa for alkali, as we will see later in this tutorial, may be above 7.4 or below 7.4. Regardless, as pH rises, the hydrogen activity falls and the hydroxyl ion activity rises, and there is an increase in association of alkali. In this tutorial, I'm going to discuss the chemical structure of local anesthetics how pKa impacts local anesthetic activity, and why pKa is important in opioid pharmacology. I'm going to start with local anesthetics. Let's start with a clinical scenario. You're in the operating room, 
and Callum is a 59-year-old type 1 diabetic with a gangrenous forefoot and he's scheduled to undergo surgery for an amputation. He still has sensation in his foot so you decide to do an ankle block and you administer a generous quantity of local anaesthetic under ultrasound guidance. 30 minutes later he is still able to move his toes. Why did the block appear to fail? As anyone who's ever gone to the dentist knows, local anaesthetics are drugs that produce reversible depression of nerve conduction when applied to nerve fibres and they can be delivered in a variety of different routes. The first one was cocaine and the one that we use most commonly is lidocaine and that's been around for 80 years. The key thing to understand about the pharmacology of old local anaesthetics is that they are weak bases and they are put together something like this. There is an aromatic portion and that is lipid soluble and that's what gets the local in through the nerve sheath. If the rest of the drug is set up in a particular configuration. Then there's a long part that is either an ester or an amide. These days most local anaesthetics that you would know like ropivacaine, bupivacaine, L-bupivacaine and lidocaine are amides. The older ones such as cocaine and procaine were esters. They're not used as often anymore because of problems with allergy. And then the final component is a tertiary amine portion that is the weak base that we're talking about. The way I'm going to draw this is a fat soluble bit, an intermediate bit and a base bit. So for the rest of this tutorial this is all you need to know. That bit at the end is a base and it may be associated or it may be dissociated. The local anaesthetics that we use in our clinical practice have PKAs in the region of 8, which means that at 7.4 these drugs are more dissociated. And as that pH goes down further, they are less and less and less associated, they are more ionised. Local anaesthesia products are sold as salts dissolved in water and what happens is the salts are made up of the local anaesthetic plus a acid. And in this case you have the base that's ropivacaine and the acid that's chloride. So you have ropivacaine hydrochloride, bupivacaine hydrochloride, lidocaine hydrochloride and levobupivacaine hydrochloride. And the pharmacology of this is really kind of interesting. Let's look at a little bottle of water. And of course at a pH of 7.0 the number of hydrogen ion and hydroxyl ion equivalents are exactly the same. Now we have our local anaesthetic chloride salt and we're going to dissolve that in water at that pH of 7.0. And of course everything ionizes so the chloride separates all from the local anaesthetic and they're now completely ionized for a very very short period of time. Subsequently hydroxyl binds to some of the local anaesthetic molecules, not all of them, just some of them because it's a weak base at that pH. Due to its very low pKa, chloride remains unbound. Let me try and explain this. Acid-base balance is all about the relative ratio of hydrogen ion equivalents to hydroxyl ion equivalents. At pH of 7 in pure water these are equal. If the hydrogen ion content increases the pH falls, if the hydroxyl ion content increases relative to hydrogen then the pH rises. When we dissolve a weak base bound to a strong acid, in this case bupivacaine hydrochloride, after initial ionization the weak base will mop up the free hydroxide because of its modest pKa of 8.1. Chloride being a relatively strong acid with a pKa of less than 1 will not bind hydrogen. Consequently the relative ratio of hydroxyl to hydrogen falls and the liquid becomes more acidic. The pH of this bupivacaine solution is 6. Now something similar happens with isotonic saline solution. The pKa for hydrochloric acid is further below 7 than the pKa for sodium hydroxide is above 7. That is hydrochloric acid is a stronger acid than sodium hydroxide is a base and consequently the liquid in solution in the bottle is slightly acidic with a pH of 5.5. The major advantage of storing this local anaesthetic at a pH of 6 is that at that particular level the 
local anesthetic is nearly completely ionized, as is the chloride. And so it is extremely unlikely at that pH that a salt will form. Consequently, we are able to store these local anesthetics in the little vials or little bottles on shelves for months and months and months on end. And you can take that vial out of your drawer, off your shelf at any time, and you know exactly what's in it, what the concentration is, and what effect that will have. And that is truly elegant. And of course, the local anesthetic, when it goes into the body, it won't stay at that degree of ionization because the degree of association between that level of pH at 6 is completely different than it is at a pH of 7.4. Let's have a look at what happens when local anesthetic is injected into tissue that's well perfused and well oxygenated. Here's our syringe that has the local anesthetic in it with a pH of 6. We're going to go ahead and inject that local anesthetic into the tissue, which is a higher pH. Once the local anesthetic has been injected into the tissues, then the chloride diffuses away and the pH into which the anesthetic is injected rises. The result is that the drug becomes more associated, in this case about 20%, and in this state the drug is more lipophilic. This is how action potentials work. Sodium passes through sodium channels into the nerve and that allows passage of electrical activity. The sodium channel is the key component of this system. Now we have two moieties of local anesthetic in the region that we've injected. The first moiety is the ionized local anesthetic. This carries a positive charge that makes it hydrophilic, it will dissolve in water and you can inject it in nice and easy, but that charge prevents it from entering that dense lipid layer that lines nerve tissue. On the other hand, the unionized local anesthetic is now electrochemically inert, meaning the dominant component of that agent is the aromatic layer and this passes easily into the nerve tissue. Going back to our picture, We've now gone from outside the cell with a pH of 7.4 and 20% association or 80% ionization. Now we're going to go inside the cell and inside the cell the pH is lower and because of that there is more ionization. So the local anesthetic that was unionized that goes into the cell now reionizes and this is what makes it pharmacologically active. So inside the neuron, the charge is dropped. Now we have a positively charged local anesthetic. It's reionized, and that happily passes in to the sodium channel and blocks it and prevents sodium from activating that channel. And hence, you have numbness and loss of neurotransmission beyond that level. So that's how local anesthetics work. And it's a really nice example of how alterations in the pH and the pKa make the drug work better. The speed of onset of local anesthetics is determined by the pKa. The lower the pKa, the closer the pKa is to 7.4, the less ionized the local anesthetic. So lidocaine, which is a pKa of 7.9, is less ionized than bupivacaine that has a pKa of 8.4. The lower degree of ionization locally, the faster the onset of action. And you can see in this table, that lidocaine with a pKa of 7.9 is 25% associated at a pH of 7.4. Bupivacaine, L-bupivacaine, that's chirocaine, and ropivacaine are only 17% associated. And that's why lidocaine works faster. It gets in there because it's more lipophilic. The duration of action of local anesthetics is determined by protein, principally albumin binding. The more protein bound, the longer the duration of action. And the reason for this is that the protein probably provides a depot for maintenance of the neuroblockade. And you can see that lidocaine is only 70% protein bound, bupivacaine, L-bupivacaine, that's chirocaine and robivacaine or narapin, are much more protein bound. The slightly higher level for bupivacaine suggests that it has a longer duration of action.
The potency of local anesthetics is determined by lipid solubility. Now what I mean by potency is the dose versus the response. For example, beer is less potent than wine and wine is less potent than whiskey. They'll all get you drunk, it just requires a lower volume to do so. So the higher the lipid solubility, the more potent the drug. Once that unionized local anesthetic abuts the nerve, the more lipid soluble that aromatic ring is, the more powerful it is at entering inside the cell and causing a block. So the lipid solubility determines how potent the drug is, the dose you need to give, and it also provides a longer duration of action. Bupivacaine is roughly 10 times more potent than lidocaine. So when should you use something like lidocaine? Well, it's a rapid onset, short duration of action, works within three to six minutes, lasts for an hour or two, comes in 1% or 2% for a slightly higher potency, and it has a ability to have its duration of action prolonged by giving a bit of epinephrine or perhaps dexamethasone. And there's a fairly wide safety margin here. The safe dose is at least 200 milligrams, probably higher. There are long-acting local anesthetics, and the original one of these, and the best, let's be honest, is bupivacaine. The problem with bupivacaine is if it's injected intravenously in high dose, is that it can bind irreversibly to cardiac tissue and cause a cardiac arrest. So decades of research went into finding a long-acting local anesthetic that looked and smelt like bupivacaine without the risk. And two different drugs became available. L-bupivacaine, which is considered to be the safer version of bupivacaine, it's known as tyrocaine, and ropivacaine. Ropivacaine is considered to be slightly less cardiotoxic than bupivacaine. It's less potent as well and it has a slightly shorter duration of action and it is thought to promote more sensory than motor block which is something that you may or may not want for a patient who's having surgery under regional anesthesia. Now I don't know how they prove that it's less toxic because it's not like as if a life-ending dose of these drugs were given in clinical trials to patients. But nevertheless, albupivacaine and ropivacaine considered to be slightly safer, but not in the tiny doses, for example, that we might use for spinal anesthesia. If you look around the operating rooms, you will find vials of lidocaine and bupivacaine that include epinephrine, usually one in 200,000. And the reason why epinephrine is added is because of the belief that this causes local vasoconstriction, so there's less bleeding at the site from local infiltration, there's less systemic absorption. That should potentially make the drug safer to give and make it less likely that the patient will have local anesthetic systemic toxicity from a slightly higher dose. It's also believed that epinephrine prolongs the duration of action. Another approach that I see a lot in anesthesia practice is mixing up of long and short acting local anesthetics. This is very popular. And what one does is mix up, for example, lidocaine or 2%, which has a rapid onset of action with something that's longer acting like ropivacaine or bubivacaine. And the idea is that by giving the mixture, the lidocaine will speed up the onset of the block for a long case or for post-operative analgesia where you need that long duration and maybe you want someone to have a very little pain over the first 24 hours. And this is often caused by an inpatient surgeon who's hassling you to get the operation started as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, the mixture has little impact on the onset of the block and significantly shortens the duration of the block. This is not a great approach and I advise against it. You remember Callum who had type 1 diabetes, a gangrenous forefoot, who was having an ankle block for this amputation. Why did his block fail? Let's go back to this picture. We have our syringe of local anesthetic that's at a pH of 6. The tissue though is different from what we saw before. This tissue is poorly perfused, poorly oxygenated, there may be a lot of lactate in the tissue, and the pH is 7, not 7.4. Now remember, we are talking about weak bases here. So if the tissue is infected and the local pH is 7, that is a lot further from the pKa of 8.0 than 7.4. And as a consequence, when you inject that local anesthetic, the agent is more ionized and less likely to penetrate nerve tissue. Here is the example. 
We're starting at a pH of 6, that's what's in the bottle, and we're highly ionized. Instead of going up to 7.4, we're only going as far as 7. And at that point, the degree of association is really low. It's, for example, only 5%. It is the unionized, electrochemically neutral local anesthetic that goes into nerve tissue. The more unionized, the more rapid the onset of action, the more ionized, the slower the onset of action, hence the sluggishness at which this block is happening. So what can we do to improve the situation? Well, there's two things we can do. We can alkalinize the local anesthetic and we can alkalinize the tissue. And you can do both by putting sodium bicarbonate into the syringe. This will have a dual effect of increasing the degree of association of what's in the syringe, remembering that it's only going to be in there for a couple of minutes, so it's not going to turn to chalk or anything, and also increasing the pH of the tissue. So instead of injecting that local anesthetic into tissue that's seven, the injection itself will buffer up the tissue to 7.4, thus increasing the amount of available local anesthetic to enter into the cell and push the block along. So in this situation, what we have is a pH of 7. We've given sodium bicarbonate, it increases the local pH. And then the CO2 that's generated from this goes into the cell. That reduces the intracellular pH, increasing the amount of ionization within the cell and increasing the onset of action of the local anesthetic. So this is a really nice way of both increasing the onset of action and increasing the performance within the cell. Sometimes carbonated lidocaine is given to advance the onset of action within the cell itself. So if you see somebody reaching for sodium bicarbonate when they're drawing up their local anesthetic, they're doing this for two reasons. One. It reduces the pain on injection because it's less acidic. The pH of 6 makes it kind of sting a bit when you give local anesthetic, but it also speeds up the onset of the block by reducing extracellular ionization, but the CO2 going into the cell increases intracellular ionization. Works a treat. Intravenous lidocaine by infusion is used quite a lot these days for treatment of severe pain, either for inpatients or pain patients who come in for outpatient therapy. It's also been traditionally used for treatment of cardiac arrhythmias. In acidosis, lidocaine given intravenously or by any route is less effective due to greater ionization and protein binding. In alkalosis, caused for example by hyperventilation, there is increased effectiveness due to lower ionization, lower protein binding, and as a result there is an increase in the risk of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Keep in mind that in critical illness, hypoalbuminemia is universally present. That means there is increased bioavailability due to lower binding. One component of local anesthesia that you may have encountered over the years is the concept of freebasing cocaine. Freebasing cocaine is a popular way of increasing the speed of onset of the high that abusers experience. Remember that cocaine, just like all of the other local anesthetics, is prepared as a hydrochloride acid salt in powder or liquid form. As a powder, it's principally snorted. And what is done by the drug dealers is that various chemical agents are used to wash away the hydrochloric acid component of the salt, resulting in a much higher free alkaline level. So you get rid of that chloride and the pH goes up, and so you have these crystals of just pure alkaline cocaine. Now these are smoked, and due to their alkalinity, they are absorbed really quickly into neural tissue, and that presumably increases the pleasure that these folks experience. Let's move on to opioids. Opioid agents derived from morphine, but mostly made synthetically or semi-synthetically now, are used universally in anesthesiology, surgery, and in critical care. And they're used as part of the balanced anesthesia techniques that many of us use, principally for post-operative analgesia, for curtailment of the stress response to reduce the adrenergic response to injury or surgery, and finally to sedate patients. These are drugs that are also widely abused in the community and are associated with hundreds of thousands of deaths from overdose per year.
Opioids are weak bases. Those of you who work in the ICU will be familiar with packets of opioids like these that contain ampules of liquid opioid. These are prepared as salts and then diluted in the liquid. So we have morphine sulfate and fentanyl citrate and then a bunch of different other opioids are bound up with chlorides such as oxycodone, methadone, hydromorphone and remifentanil, just like with local anesthetics and they have similar pharmacological properties. The onset of action of opioids is associated with the PKA. Again, unionizations have a more rapid onset of action. The duration of action is a combination of protein binding and hydrophilicity. That means the lower the volume of the distribution, the more hydrophilic, the less lipophilic, the longer the duration of action of the drug. The potency, and to an extent the onset, is determined by lipophilicity, that is fat solubility. The more lipophilic, the more potent the drug, and the higher the volume of distribution. This is a very busy table, and you can see the list of the agents that you may have encountered in medicine Alfentanil, remifentanil, morphine, hydromorphone, fentanyl, oxycodone, and pethidine or meperidine. What's really noticeable on this table is when you look in at the PKAs, alfentanil and remifentanil, although they are weak bases, have PKAs below 7.4. All of the other ones, morphine, hydromorphone, etc., have PKAs more like what we saw with local anesthetics in the region of about 8. And it's important to understand that these low PKAs have really useful properties for these particular agents being used, in particularly in anesthesia practice. Let's start with remifentanil. Remifentanil has a PKA of 7.1, so that at 7.1 it is 50% associated and 50% dissociated. That means being a weak base when this is injected into the body where the pH is 7.4, about 60% of this agent exists associated, unionized. And unionized means lipophilic, which means that it can easily enter neural tissue. So the onset of action is really rapid. Now, if we move on and look at alfentanil, you can figure out something similar. Alfentanil has a pKa of 6.5. Again, that's where it's 50% ionized and 50% unionized. But when alfentanil is injected into the body at the higher pH, it is about 90% unionized. And that means it has an extremely rapid onset of action. Consequence of this extraordinarily high level of ionization of both alfentanil and remifentanil is these drugs work extremely rapidly, which makes them useful in, in emergency situations like emergency intubation. They can also be used as infusions. The disadvantage, of course, is rapid onset of tachyphylaxis and the risk that an accidental overdose of these drugs will rapidly result in apnea and death. Let's look at the longer acting agents. And the first one I want to look at is oxycodone. And oxycodone is a pKa of 8.4. And that means that below that pKa level, towards the pH level of 7.4, it is going to become progressively less unionized, or progressively more ionized. So at 7.4, only 9% of oxycodone exists in the unionized and electrochemically active state. So its onset of action is going to be sluggish. Morphine has a slightly lower pKa at 7.9 than hydromorphone or oxycodone. And as a consequence, if you've been following me, you will understand that that means that morphine will be slightly less ionized at physiologic pH than either of those. So about 25% of morphine exists in that lipophilic unionized state at physiologic pH. That means that the onset of action of morphine is slightly faster than hydromorphone or oxycodone, but significantly slower than alfentanil or remifentanil. Long acting opioids have similar pharmacology to one another. They've relatively high ionization, so there is sluggish onset of action.
there's low to moderate protein binding and low lipid solubility, which means they're hydrophilic, which lowers the volume of distribution. And that actually helps with the pharmacokinetics of these drugs. I'm going to point out two particular agents that we use in ICU a lot, hydromorphone and morphine. And you can see that the protein binding, particularly of hydromorphone, is quite low and its partition coefficient is quite low. That means it doesn't enter fat and stay there, but it also doesn't bind to albumin. So pharmacologically, this looks like a major advantage when we have a lot of changes in the body water of our patients and we have a lot of albumin dilution and albumin loss. The greater the amount of protein binding, the larger the effect of hypoalbuminemia on drug availability. Low protein or protein dilution that happens in hypervolemia results in higher availability of protein bound drugs. And the big exception here is hydromorphone with its low binding, its levels remain really stable. Remember that acidosis increases protein binding and reduces availability. Fentanyl is an extremely potent opioid analgesic. It is very highly ionized, but it's extremely lipid soluble. So even though there isn't an awful lot of unionized fentanyl around, because it's so potent and it's so lipid soluble, there is rapid uptake into nerve tissue and fairly swift onset of action. But then it rapidly redistributes to fatty tissue and there's high protein binding. So the therapeutic window of this drug is really narrow. It works for a very, very short period of time and then disappears. And really only is very effective if given in an enormous volume because of the amount of fat in the body that soaks it up. As a consequence, the pharmacokinetics of this particular agent are really unpredictable in critical illness, and there's a huge problem with it being a short-acting agent and high risk of tachyphylaxis. Now, a question that you might get asked, for example, in an exam, is why don't anesthesiologists give fentanyl at the beginning of GA, general anesthesia, caesarean sections? And the answer is as follows. The mother has a pH of somewhere in the region of 7.4. It may not be exactly that, but it's in that region. And the fetus has a pH that is significantly lower, maybe 7.25. And the two are connected by the placenta. The highly lipophilic agent fentanyl rapidly passes due to its lipophilicity through the placenta into the fetus. But once inside the more acidic environment inside the fetus results in higher ionization and fentanyl being trapped. Fentanyl is trapped because the ionized chemical cannot pass back through the placenta into the mom. As pH rises following birth, the fentanyl enters neurologic tissue because it's less ionized and it may cause respiratory depression. And studies that have been done over many decades have shown that babies given fentanyl have lower APCAR scores than babies not given fentanyl. And remember, you have two other options these days. You have alfentanyl and in particular remifentanyl that don't linger around. Finally, it would seem bad manners not to discuss the greatest achievement of pharmacological manipulation of pH in a drug, and that is midazolam. Benzodiazepines for intravenous or intramuscular injection have always been compromised by the problem that they are highly liposoluble agents that cannot be dissolved in water. These drugs such as diazepam or lorazepam are usually prepared for IM or IV injection in propylene glycol. This is a nasty substance and it makes infusions problematic. First of all, it's osmotically active, so it can cause an osmotic gap, it can cause metabolic acidosis, and it can cause severe pain and injection, and ulceration of the skin if given accidentally subcutaneously. So why not just make the benzodiazepine more water soluble? Well, the more water soluble the product, the slower the onset of action. Conversely, High lipid solubility leads to relatively fast onset of action by these horrible agents that you need to dissolve these products into. So midazolam was developed to resolve these problems. Midazolam is a weak base. Its pKa is a magical 6.7. That means that at physiologic pH, this is a highly unionized, highly lipid soluble drug. It's prepared in a hydrochloride salt solution that is constructed to a pH of three. So essentially that chloride brings the pH right down and makes this particular drug highly ionized 
at the pH of the fluid in which it's prepared. The drug exists in two configurations. An open ring form that is highly ionized and water soluble and that ring remains open until a pH exceeds 4 at which point the ring starts to close and it is fully closed at physiologic pH making the agent extremely fat soluble. So this is what it looks like in the open ring form at a pH of 3. This is where the ring closes and at 7.4 the ring is fully closed. These pharmacological changes make this drug extremely water soluble in the open ring form and extremely fat soluble in the closed ring form. So the drug can be prepared in a standard IV fluid and injected into the patient and when it goes into the patient it works really quickly with a relatively short duration of action. Now let's move on and review the tutorial. In this tutorial we looked at local anaesthetics and opioids and I explained that both local anaesthetics and opioids are weak bases. Understanding the pKa of these agents helps with the understanding of pharmacology, particularly the onset of action. The pKa of local anaesthetics can be manipulated to increase the speed of onset of these agents in health and disease. An understanding of the pKa and protein binding is important in critical care due to pH changes and hypoalbuminemia. So that was local anesthetics and opioids and the effect of pH and pKa on their biological activity. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube to this channel or follow me at ccmtutorials.org.